This is one of my favorite experiments of all time because if you think about it deeply enough, it becomes really counterintuitive and you have to dig even deeper than that to solve the mystery at the core of it. You may have seen this experiment on YouTube already, but I can almost guarantee that you haven't seen an explanation of how it works. I certainly wasn't able to find one. It's an experiment that shows how sugar in solution can twist light. Specifically, it can change the direction of polarized light. You probably know what polarized light is already, but just to recap, so Light is um, an oscillation in the electric and magnetic fields that permeate the universe. So, you know, if, if light is traveling towards you, that represents an oscillation in the electric field and perpendicular to that, an oscillation in the magnetic field. For simplicity's sake, it's a good idea to just ignore the magnetic field and just focus on the electric field just because it makes diagrams cleaner, but just know that the magnetic field is oscillating as well and it's perpendicular to the electric field. So you've got light traveling towards you. Here's the oscillation in the electric field and it's going up and down, but it could just as easily be going side to side. In fact, it could be oscillating in, in any of those directions. But because it's a quantum mechanical system, actually it can be a superposition of all those different directions. And that's what unpolarized light is. It's light that is in a superposition of the electric field oscillating in all different directions. If you pass unpolarized light through a polarizing filter like this one, then it restricts all those oscillations down into just one direction. So the light reaching the camera from my face is polarized and I can change the direction of that polarized light by you know, turning the filter like this. This computer monitor has a polarizing filter in it like most computer monitors actually. So all the light coming from this monitor is already polarized. If I put another polarizing filter in front and change the angle, you can see the effect. So if I put the polarizing filter at 90 degrees to the polarization of the light coming from the monitor, then it all gets blocked. But if I line them up, then the polarizing filter lets all the light through. Here's the crazy part though. If I put this cylinder full of sugar water between the monitor and the filter, now look, some of the light gets through. And that's because the sugar is twisting the polarized light. It's changing the direction of it so that some of it can now get through the filter. The more sugar you put in the way, the more the light turns. So I've chosen a concentration of sugar that turns the light about 90 degrees. It's only approximate because different wavelengths respond differently, which is why the color changes as I rotate the filter. This whole thing was mind blowing to past Steve. I couldn't figure out how this jumble of molecules that are all oriented in different directions could possibly have this effect, could possibly lead to a net turning in the clockwise direction and, and always clockwise, never counterclockwise. That doesn't make sense. Like surely if there's a molecule in the solution that slightly turns the light clockwise, then there's going to be another molecule oriented in a different way that will turn it slightly counterclockwise. The net result should be no twist in the direction of the polarized light at all. Like it felt like a glitch in the universe. That's not the solution, by the way. To get to the answer, we need to look again at the superposition of different polarized states. So imagine you've got some light and it's in a superposition of two states. One is polarized horizontally, the other is polarized vertically. So you've got an electric field oscillating up and down in one state, and you've got the electric field oscillating side to side in the other state. What does the superposition look like? Well, you can actually just think about it like summing up those two waves. So look at this point in space, for example. What is the sum of the displacement of the electric field at this point? Well, it's displaced a little bit vertically and a little bit horizontally. The superposition of those two states is just this point here, right? It's a little bit vertical and it's a little bit horizontal, so it's out here. If you look at the superposition of the two states at this point, well, the electric field is not displaced at all from zero, from, from the axis at this point. So the superposition is zero as well. Then at this point, you're a little bit out to the right and you're a little bit down. And so the superposition at that point is diagonally down and to the right. And if we do that for all the points along the axis, 
then we get this result here. In other words, the superposition of these two states can just be thought of as a third state, which is at 45 degrees to those two. Let's do that same exercise again, but this time shift the vertically polarized state forward through a quarter of a wavelength. Let's see what happens now. Looking at this point, the superposition must be just out to the left there because the vertical component is zero. At this point, the superposition must be just vertically downwards because the horizontal component is zero. At this point, the superposition must be to the right because the vertical component is zero. At this point, the superposition must be vertically upwards because the horizontal component is zero. So let's join those points together and this is the result, this helix, this spiral. So this is clockwise circularly polarized light and you can have counterclockwise circularly polarized light as well. So you can think of circularly polarized light as the superposition of two linearly polarized states that are perpendicular to each other, where one of them is offset by a quarter of a wavelength. You know, if you search online for things like circularly polarized light and superposition, you'll find diagrams like this one. What's interesting is there's a diagram that you won't find, or at least I wasn't able to find, and it's really important for this explanation. And it's a diagram of the opposite of what we just did, because it turns out that the superposition of two circularly polarized states, one clockwise, one anticlockwise, gives you linearly polarized light. So look, this is maybe the first time this diagram is appearing on the internet ever, certainly that I've been able to find, almost certainly in video form. Look, you've got two states here. One is polarized in the counterclockwise direction. One is polarized in the clockwise direction. Let's look at some points and see how they add up. So look, at this point, the two waves are in the same place. So the superposition must be there at that point. Here, you've only got horizontal components in each wave and they're in opposite directions, so they cancel out. Here, the two waves meet again, so the superposition must be at that point. Here, the two horizontal components cancel out, so it must be here. So let's draw all those points in and see what the result is. It's linearly polarized light. So that's really important. You can think of linearly polarized light as the superposition of two polarized states one circularly polarized in the clockwise direction, the other circularly polarized in the counterclockwise direction. So what happens when light like this passes through a solution of sugar, like the light coming from my monitor? Well, I want you to imagine that the solution of sugar is like this bag of pasta. It's actually nothing like this bag of pasta, but I want you to imagine that it is just for a minute. So you've got all these molecules all jumbled up, all in different orientations. Let's have a look at what happens when the light passes through a single one of those molecules and it happens to be oriented vertically like this. So the light is linearly polarized, which we can think of as the superposition of two circularly polarized states going in opposite directions. And hopefully you can see that those two states will have a very different experience of traveling through this molecule of pasta. The clockwise circularly polarized state is in step with the pasta. It's nestled into the grooves of the pasta, whereas the anticlockwise state is in opposition to those turns. It's constantly bumping into those flaps of pasta. For the purposes of illustration, I've chosen a wavelength of light that matches the spacing of the pasta spirals. In reality, it's not gonna be like that most of the time, but hopefully you can see regardless of the wavelength that those two different directions of circularly polarized light will have a different experience of passing through the pasta. Why does that matter? Well, you probably already know that light travels more slowly in glass. And so the peaks and troughs of the wave have to bunch up to compensate. In other words, the wavelength goes down. And that's true when light passes through anything, actually, not just glass. It's also true when light passes through a molecule, like our spirally pasta molecule here. Let's suppose hypothetically that the clockwise circularly polarized component of our light interacts more strongly with the pasta because it spends more time traveling through those flaps. 
Well, in that case, we would expect that component to be slowed down more. To relate that back to the language that we use to talk about light, you would say that the index of refraction for this pasta is higher for clockwise circularly polarized light than anti-clockwise circularly polarized light. The two components of light see a different refractive index when they interact with this pasta. So if the counterclockwise component of the light is traveling more quickly through the pasta than the clockwise component of the light, it will have traveled further by the time it exits the pasta at the top there. In other words, the counterclockwise component would have shifted up relative to the counterclockwise component. What does that do to the superposition of these two states? Hopefully you can see from this animation that if you shift one of the components or states of polarized light forward, it causes the superposition in yellow to rotate. So if we have a solution of sugar where all the molecules are all pointing in the same direction, they're all aligned vertically like this all throughout the solution, then we would expect the light to twist as it comes up. And to reiterate why, that's because this linearly polarized light is the superposition of two circularly polarized light um, states, and they have a different experience as they travel through. One goes more slowly than the other, so by the time they leave, the, the phase between them has shifted, and that twists the superposition. But a solution of sugar is not like that. It's a jumble of molecules in all different directions. And, and this is where we have to correct my uh, misassumption at the start. Because my thinking was like, look, if you've got, uh, you know, pasta or a molecule oriented this way in space and that's twisting light like this, then all you need to do is find another molecule that's oriented the other way and that will twist it back the way it came. So the net result of all these jumbled up molecules should be no rotation at all. But that's a mistake because look, watch what happens if I turn this pasta upside down. It's genuinely unremarkable, like not very much happens. Look at the direction of the spiral. So as you move up through the pasta from bottom to top, the edge moves from left to right. And if we switch it upside down, maybe we expect that to reverse so that it goes from right to left. But look, as I turn it upside down like that, it stays the same. The edge of the pasta still goes from left to right as you move up through the pasta. In other words, it doesn't matter if you have the pasta oriented this way or this way, the experience of light passing through it will be the same. The clockwise and counterclockwise components uh, will have a different experience and that difference in experience will be the same regardless of which way up the pasta is. The experiences don't switch. You know this about spirals already from everyday experience. Look, here's a bolt that has a spiral on it and the inside of this nut has a spiral on it. And I can turn the nut upside down, right? And it still works. The explanation isn't complete because sugar molecules don't look like this. They look like this. So what is the fundamental attribute that these two things have in common that matters in this scenario? Well, it's handedness. They both have a handedness. In other words, they don't have mirror symmetry. If you looked at this pasta in a mirror, the mirror image of the pasta would be different in a fundamental way, in the same way that my hands have handedness. Like, if you look at my left hand in a mirror, you wouldn't see another left hand, you'd see a right hand, and they're fundamentally different. Like if you could take that right hand from inside the mirror like a ghost and try and line it up with the left hand, you wouldn't be able to. There's no way to get them to overlap perfectly, and not just because my hands are slightly different and not just because I'm married. The same is true for these molecules here. If you took a mirror image of this glucose molecule, the molecule would be fundamentally different. You wouldn't be able to rearrange that molecule and, and line it up on top of this one. To really hammer the point home, let's see what happens with molecules that do have mirror symmetry like these ones here. So look, let's orient the molecule like that and let's imagine light traveling up through uh, the molecule like this. And it's again, it's the superposition of uh, circularly polarized in that direction and in, in that direction. Maybe you could persuade yourself that they would have a different experience uh, passing through this molecule. How would you then undo that? How would you reverse that? 
Well, all you need is the mirror image of this molecule somewhere else in the path of the light. So let's put the mirror image up here like that. And they really are the mirror image. Look, there you go. See again, they're like they're the mirror image there. And so it, it passes through uh, one and then it passes through the other and, and uh, whatever, it, preferential treatment for the left-handed versus the right-handed is undone with this mirror image. But of course, because these molecules have mirror symmetry, they're just the same molecule, right? So you'll find the mirror image of this orientation floating around elsewhere in the, the solution. What about this sugar molecule then? Imagine light passing through this molecule. Hopefully you can persuade yourselves that uh, clockwise circularly polarized light will have a different experience to counterclockwise circularly polarized light as it passes through this mo molecule. To undo that effect, you would need the light to pass through the same molecule, but a mirror image of itself up here. And you can't create the mirror image by flipping it in any direction because the molecule has a handiness. It doesn't have mirror symmetry. You can't create the mirror image of itself just by reorienting it. So there you go. It's because sugar molecules have a handedness and it's because linearly polarized light can be thought of as the superposition of two states of circularly polarized light in opposite directions. By the way, uh, you may have heard of sugar being referred to as dextrose. Dextro meaning to the right, because dextrose or glucose turns light to the right. Clockwise and counterclockwise. I've been using an app called Blinkist for a little over a year now. They're the sponsor of this video. Blinkist does something remarkable. It's an app that condenses the key insights from non-fiction books into 15 minute reads. They're also audio narrated, so you can listen to them in the car or while you're doing housework or something like that. And I thought I would share my favorite books that I've consumed in this fashion over the last year or so. Uh, so they are Sapiens, amazing book, uh, Digital Minimalism, Blink, uh, appropriately. Freakonomics, amazing book. Um, I actually read the whole thing after reading the blink. Um, How to talk so kids will listen and listen so kids will talk. It's a parenting book. It worked really well for our kids. Um, how to make friends and influence people. Um, you know, it's interesting how much that's got in common with how to talk so kids will listen, listen so kids will talk. They're basically instructions on how to be nice in a clever way to get what you want. It's amazing. Um, actually, I, I read the whole books of those two as well after doing the 15 minute blinks. They also have full audio books now, by the way, and members get them for a vastly reduced price, like 65% off on average. The first 100 people to go to blinkist.com forward slash Steve Mold will get one week absolutely free to try it out. No strings attached, cancel whenever you like. And if you wanna carry on with full membership, you get 25% off as well. The link is also in the description. So check out Blinkist today. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, don't forget to hit subscribe and I'll see you next time.